episode of Off The Script number 143, part number 3 for your Sunday, November 13th, 2016. We got news on Vince McMahon placing the blame on Sasha Banks for Hell in a Cell. Really? This is what we're doing now. Now we're fucking placing blame on the competitors that walk inside such a demonic structure, correct? Yeah, it really makes sense, Vince McMahon. Also news on Booker T wanting James Ellsworth out of the company and for him to go back to the indies. That's an interesting story this weekend as well. Major double switch being planned for the Survivor Series. What does that mean? Will we see the IC title on Raw? Will we see the Cruiserweight title on SmackDown? That remains to be seen. I got big news on that. And finally, TNA Wrestling planning to introduce their own WWE Network style streaming service. Also, Billy Corgan settles in court with TNA Wrestling. All this plus so much more on Off The Script. Fill your glasses up and put your headphones in because it's time for Off The Script. And all you fucking goons and assholes get in line and hit subscribe because it's time for Off The Script. Vince McMahon is placing blame on Sasha Banks for what happened inside Hell in a Cell two weeks ago. Let me rephrase that. Vince McMahon, a 70-year-old, out-of-touch, king goon in WWE, who doesn't know jack shit anymore about his own fucking product and his company, Especially on the creative side. The business side, I'll give him. The creative side, absolutely nothing. He's placing blame on a 105-pound Sasha Banks for the botched ending at Hell in a Cell. Well, I don't know, Vince. I've been saying for fucking weeks leading up to this match that this match shouldn't even be taking place let alone inside Hell in a Cell, but then you want to blame Sasha Banks for when things don't go right. Let me ask you something, Vince. Would you have blamed Charlotte if it was the other way around? If Charlotte didn't go through the table three fucking times and then Sasha was getting visibly upset, would you have blamed Charlotte for the fucking botched ending at uh, inside Hell in a Cell? Probably not. Probably not. It's because Charlotte is... Consider Charlotte the Roman Reigns of the women's division. Remember those fucking reports that WWE and Vince McMahon wanted to make Dana Brooke the Roman Reigns of the women's division? We already have a Roman Reigns of the women's division. Charlotte can do no wrong. Charlotte can do no wrong. I mean, she could fail a drug test, wellness policy violation, and be right back in her position 30 days later. I mean, it doesn't matter. Charlotte is one of the elite in WWE. So if Charlotte was the one in Sasha's position inside Hell in a Cell, they would not blame her. I think favoritism is actually taking place here, especially inside the Hell in a Cell and following Hell in a Cell and in the women's division. And you're going to realize that and it's going to become more apparent when I read to you exactly what Vince McMahon's feelings are about this entire situation. Prior to Monday Night's Raw, um, last exclusive brand pay-per-view, Hell in a Cell, there was a lot of backstage debate over which match should headline the pay-per-view. We all know that. It was going back and forth. It was either Kevin Owens 
and Seth Rollins, which was main event worthy after we seen what those guys did inside Hell in a Cell, or it was going to come down to the women's match for the championship, let alone not only that being a determining factor, and that was probably, you know, the feud was garbage, but out of all three matches, it was probably the one that was put, you know, ahead of everything else. There was more effort put into building that feud than the other two cell matches. Plus, it was Sasha Banks' hometown. So that alone made it, you know, worthy of a main event. So coming down the home stretch of the buildup, the WWE was billing it as having three main events. In reality, all of the Hell to Cell matches on the card, only two could make the claim that they deserved the closing of the show. Roman Reigns and Rusev opened Hell in a Cell, quickly quelling any thoughts that the United States Championship match would have the honors. I didn't think that was going to be the main event. You know, there's just a little part of me that, you know, WWE wants to position Roman Reigns in a main event. But out of this, out of these three matches and on this night, you kind of knew it wasn't going to be the main event. And the fact that they had three Hell in a Cells, you know, the, the likelihood that WWE was going to do anything else, was thrown out the window. They had three Hell in a Cell matches. One had to be zi- be positioned in the first match, and then the middle, and then the end. That's just the way they had to do it. So that's what we seen as soon as Hell in a Cell started. It opened the show, the United States Championship did, and then it was reported that day that Charlotte and Sasha earned the main event slot instead of Kevin Owens and Seth Rollins for the WWE Universal Championship. I didn't care that they main evented. I did not care that Sasha and Charlotte main evented. Obviously, I don't like to see your main championship not in the main event, but the feud between Rollins and Owens really wasn't doing anything. And a lot of us can agree that Jericho was more important than both Rollins and Owens, and Owens was the universal champion. Jericho's gimmick is more over than Owens and him being the WWE Universal Champion. So I didn't care that Charlotte and Sasha got the main event. I was happy. I'd like to see that a little bit more often when the situation calls for it and when the feud is properly built up. This wasn't properly built up. My whole problem with this was that it was dead before we got to Hell in a Cell. We seen it God knows how many times. Rinse and repeat. Take the title off Charlotte, put it on Sasha. Take the belt off Sasha, put it on Charlotte. Back and forth. It's like they're playing fucking, uh, it's like they're playing hacky sack. You know, it's like fucking ridiculous. As it turned out, most of the people in the WWE were pushing for the women to get the main event spot. With Vince McMahon alone, as always, in the fight to continue with the tradition of closing out pay-per-views with the world title match. I am with Vince McMahon in this one, okay, most of the time. But on this night, they were allowed to do something with the women that was never done before. And at the conclusion of Hell in a Cell, Vince might have felt that, ultimately, the wrong decision was made. Sure, Charlotte and Sasha made history twice in one night, but the finish of their match left a lot to be desired. According to a report from DailyWrestlingNews.com, Vince McMahon is placing the majority of the blame for the finish to Hell in a Cell in the main event squarely on the shoulders of Sasha Banks. Vince felt that the finish fell flat because of Sasha's performance, not because Charlotte won the match in Sasha's hometown of Boston, which left many of the fans disappointed. The planned finish was supposed to see Charlotte put Sasha through the table that was set up in the ring hit her with the natural selection, and cover her for the final pinfall. They tried the table spot twice, but it didn't work either time, and they just went ahead with Charlotte's finisher to end the match awkwardly. The feeling amongst many backstage, aside from Vince, was that it was neither performer's fault. There was one camp that felt that the table spot didn't work, that they should have improvised a new finish, but others believe Sasha would have garnered more heat from the chairman had she kicked out of the natural selection. Furthermore, there were several WWE officials and performers backstage that felt the referee should have helped them call an audible and instructed them to create a new finish, either by Charlotte rolling up Sasha with the tights or by some other means. 
Charlotte clearly looked somewhat agitated and upset after the victory, and some felt that she should have celebrated her championship victory more instead of being so stoic. The decision for the women to main event Hell in a Cell was only made a week leading up to the show, but the call to put the belt back on Charlotte was only finalized Saturday night, the night before the pay-per-view. According to reports, Vince McMahon has absolutely zero regrets about his final decision to take the title of Sasha and put it back on Charlotte. He only felt that the match lacked the necessary finish worthy of a main event spot he gave them. Their place on the Hell in a Cell card goes down in history with the hope that it opens up the door for other women to headline, compete in gimmick matches, or both in the future. However, considering the fact that Vince wasn't in favor of Sasha and Charlotte headlining the Hell in a Cell pay-per-view to begin with, and his feelings coming out of the match now with the botched ending, it might be a very long while before the, before the opportunity comes along again for the women, or at least a lot more convincing argument from the main champion of the cause, Triple H. There's a lot I want to say here, but I, I don't even know where to begin, man. You know, you guys know how I feel about this match going on inside Hell in a Cell. The match totally didn't call for it at all. And I have been a proponent for WWE taking their time with a lot of things, whether it's building a character, building a storyline, getting us invested to the point where we reach its conclusion, we can't wait to see it. You know, WWE was quick to act on this impulse that people wanted Sasha and Charlotte inside Hell in a Cell, that they wanted to make history for both Sasha and Charlotte. You know, this is not the most important thing that WWE needs to be concerned about. They really need to take a long, hard look at, at their product, man. Monday Night Raw, and I state this every single week, and I will continue to say it until you are fucking sick of me talking about it. Monday Night Raw is fucking garbage. The worst I have ever seen. Their main priority should be putting all of their eggs, all of their efforts, everything into this fucking basket to make Monday Night Raw actually watchable. Now, I don't know where you start with the show, but something needs to change. Creative writing needs to change. You got to give me storylines that are actually going to work. Storylines that are going to have a big payoff. Storylines that are going to that are gonna grab the people's attention watching at home and make them fucking care. Because if we don't care, the people in the arena are not going to react accordingly. The people at home are going to change the channel. Ratings are going to go down. Network subscriptions are going to go down because the people are fucking fed up that they're giving you their hard-earned money to something that they don't overly enjoy for $9.99. Monday Night Raw needs to change. You need to get that right before you start putting women inside Hell in a Cell. You know? This match did not need the Hell in a Cell. And I stated it on Twitter. I stated it in my Hell in a Cell review. This entire match didn't utilize the Cell. This entire match was nothing but an Extreme Rules match with Sasha and Charlotte inside a cage that was there for aesthetic reasons only. It made the match more important than it really was. And deep down, those who don't want to admit it, it was not worthy of Hell in a Cell. Was it worthy of a main event? Yes, under different circumstances. It did not belong in the main event in Hell in a Cell. Sasha and Charlotte, just by their body alone, both women's bodies don't belong inside Hell in a Cell. No women on the roster belong inside Hell in a Cell. Based on the makeup of how they are built as professional wrestlers, as human beings. Okay? In fact, the spot that everybody is calling that Vince McMahon is upset with, that he's placing blame on Sasha. I mean, you go back and look at it. What the fuck was it? What the fuck was it? Was it a hip toss? I mean, the table wasn't even positioned correctly. It wasn't positioned correctly, number one. So they fucked up there. Number two, I don't know what Charlotte did. She threw Sasha into the table. It was a hip toss on top of the table. It's like she fucking placed her gently on top of the table. 
If the table was positioned correctly, when Charlotte threw Sasha into that table, if it was positioned correctly, just the nature of the way the table is angled, and Sasha's body being hurled at that table, it would have broke. But Vince McMahon is quick to judge Sasha and place blame on Sasha. What about Charlotte? You know, when you're in the ring, you're both creating art. It's not place blame on one and give a pass to the other. If Sasha is getting the blame here, Charlotte is just equally to blame. Because she's the one executing the move on Sasha. So I could sit here and tell you, you know, I could easily blame Charlotte. Maybe throw Sasha into the table a little bit harder instead of fucking tossing her like she's fucking shoving her. Oh my god, here you go. Come on, bro. Just by when Charlotte was standing on the ring apron, she was afraid to fall back. She was afraid to fall back into the table. She looked back. She's like, you know, come on, man. But yet you want to put these women inside Hell in a Cell. All it did was present you an opportunity for these women to embarrass themselves. The work rate in the match was okay. It wasn't the best thing that they've done. The best thing that these women have done was the Monday Night Raw following the draft. When Sasha won the title on that Monday Night Raw. The Monday Night Raw where Finn Balor won a fatal four-way and then beat Roman Reigns in the main event. That was the best match that these two women have had in the last three months. Easy. Easy. But everybody wants to make history and everybody wants to fucking present something that really was never there. So... I am placing blame on both. I'm also placing blame on WWE creative. You know, the finish to this match should have easily been different. Easily. They could have booked something else. They could have they could have did a fucking top rope move, something to put Sasha through the table instead of doing that fucking pathetic ending that they had originally gone with here that we seen on the pay-per-view. Something different. But if Vince is placing blame on Sasha, I'm placing blame on Charlotte because she's the one executing the move. But again, I pose the question. If Charlotte was the one to go through the table and Sasha was the one executing the move, would Charlotte be blamed by Vince McMahon? Probably not, just because of who she is. So obviously favoritism is coming into play here. And again, you know, I blame WWE creative as well. Because they have made a mockery of the women's division on Monday Night Raw. Sasha has even went on record saying, I am tired of fighting the same women over and over again. It's either Dana Brooke, Charlotte, Charlotte, Dana Brooke. If, you're, if one of your star women is outwardly coming out on Sam Roberts' podcast and stating this, that I want more competition in the women's division, that the women's division needs more faces. Don't you know that your draft and your plan going into the draft was a complete fucking failure? I had originally stated in my mock draft, the women should have been on one show. If you are going to have... Now, now listen, whatever WWE is doing is proving me right. They are proving me right. Ideally, WWE has how many women on Monday Night Raw? I can't even fucking tell you. Because I don't know who's on the fucking roster. But from what we see right now, that are actually on television, Charlotte, Sasha, Bailey, Dana. Four. Four. And then you got Nia Jax. You can make room for Nia Jax. Because I like Nia Jax. I think she should be on television. Five. Five women. And then you look at the women on SmackDown, you got Alexa, that's six. You got Nikki, that's seven. You got Becky, that's eight. You got Naomi, that's nine. Carmella, ten. So, there you go. The other women, I don't care for. I, I really don't. N N Natalia, great in the ring. Please, you're cringe. They're not really doing anything with her to begin with. Eva Marie, please, go the fuck away. You know? Ten women. That is more than enough for one division on one show 
The women should have been exclusively on one brand. But no, WWE thinks that, okay, five women for one show, five women for the other, makes it right. But they don't understand that the rinse and repeat factor there with five on one show and then five on the other is going to get old very fast. Is going to get old very, very quickly. And this fucking sucks, dude. It really does fucking suck. And it's proving me to be right. It is proving me to be right all along. And Sasha is proving that WWE fucked up. When she's asking for more competition, she mentioned, I want Alexa. I want Naomi. I want Becky. You know? I'm tired of doing Dana Brooke and Charlotte every fucking week. Yeah, a Bailey feud is coming up. But I don't know when that's going to be. Eventually, it's going to happen. Do you see where I'm going with this? WWE is a complete fucking mess. An absolute fucking disaster. And Sasha's proven it right. WWE is proving that they fucked up. Vince McMahon, I don't know where the fuck he's getting off blaming Sasha. Blame your own fucking men for booking this match. Blame yourself for actually deciding, you know what, let's do it. When it should have never happened. Period. It didn't need it. It didn't call for it. That's it. But no, you want you want you you want to make history, right? You you want to be the first to be. Oh, 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 we did it in WWE. First ever Hell in a Cell with the women. Give me a break. Give me a fucking break. I rather book the women slowly but surely in gimmick matches that lead up to something that big. The feud never called for it. Give me a tables match, a ladder match, a Money in the Bank match, a TLC match, an Extreme Rules match, something. But to throw the women inside Hell in a Cell and bypass all of that just for the simple fact that you're making history as some marketing ploy and marketing scheme to sell your fucking pay-per-view and then have this shit happen and when things don't go right, you're going to blame the fucking performers who are risking their careers inside this fucking cage? Come on, bro. Shit like that, I do not like to hear, see, or read. Vince... Needs a fucking reality check. Big time. Big time. And the draft? Again, I don't mean to fucking pat myself on the back and stroke my own cock, but the women should have been exclusive to one brand. Seriously. The tag team division? You probably could have spread out along both because you got a lot of quality teams there. Some of which are not even being used. Which is a fucking damn shame. You know how fucking shitty it is to see the vaude villains go into a match and two minutes get squashed? This is what you think of your teams, right? Instead of building up character, making them feel important. So, that's going to get old very fast as well. Monday Night Raw has no tag team division. They have none. You got the Shining Stars, you got Goldust and R-Truth. The Shining Stars are on Team Raw for Survivor Series. That's all I got to say about that. You could have even moved the tag teams to... You could probably move the tag teams to one brand. If you want. Save the other fucking teams that we don't give a shit about. For uh, superstars in main event. They fucked up. Whenever the next draft needs to happen, they need a serious rework. They need to sit down and realize that things need to be changed. And they're still making changes now. They're still making changes now. To the point where there might be a massive double switch at the Survivor Series with the IC title going to Raw and the Cruiserweights going to SmackDown. Again. WWE is realizing slowly but surely that they fucked up. Everything coming out of the draft is getting fucked. And they don't know what the fuck they want to do. It's a fucking mess. An absolute fucking mess. To add more to this, WWE not knowing what the fuck they want to do, especially with the entire draft and brand extension, and the fact that they're constantly changing plans, if you're still changing plans now about a draft that took place before SummerSlam, obviously things are fucked up. Major double switch being planned for the Survivor Series. The Survivor Series swerves just keep coming, and they might not stop until the big, until the big event has finally ended on Sunday night. Daniel Bryan, Shane McMahon, and the SmackDown Live crew initiated cross-branded competition before Raw's Hell in a Cell pay-per-view, and the pieces have fallen into place. 
As we all know by now, Survivor Series will feature three traditional Survivor Series elimination matches, pitting teams from the blue brand against teams from Raw. It says here the flagship show, but I'm not labeling Raw as the flagship show. It is not. At all. The majority of the build towards Survivor Series on November 20 has been centered around filling out those teams, but the show will likely be headlined by the mega match billed as Fantasy Warfare. You know, one of you guys actually tweeted me a WrestleMania 33 scenario with the with the whole with the whole thing, man. The WrestleMania background for 33 in Orlando, Fantasy Warfare it has Shane McMahon pictured next to Samoa Joe versus Brock Lesnar standing next to Paul Heyman. That is Fantasy Warfare. This is not Fantasy Warfare. Maybe to a fucking six year old goon, but not for me. The big news coming out of Tuesday's SmackDown, of course, was Shane McMahon agreeing to become the fifth and final member of the Men's Survivor Series team against Raw. Shane McMahon replaces Baron Corbin, who was written off the team due to a storyline injury at the hands of Kalisto. No clowns. Baron Corbin is not really hurt. In fact, he was at a house show the very next day competing, so he is not hurt. They took him off the team for whatever reason. They figured, you know what? We need to sell this match even more. Let's put someone who is not an active wrestler in the match and fuck over the new stars. So, Baron Corbin goes from being in the main event of Survivor Series to not even being on the card. Sucks to be Baron Corbin, huh? Speaking of Kalisto, who had been injured by Corbin three months ago during their program, now, there will probably be the pre-show, now he sets his sight on more important things. It was also announced... Actually, no, Kalisto's not even going to be on the pre-show. He's fighting for the fucking Cruiserweight title. What am I talking about? Baron Corbin might be on the pre-show. They might take a bunch of fucking nobodies and put them in some mock Survivor Series match on the pre-show. Good to be Baron Corbin on SmackDown, huh? Jesus Christ. So, Kalisto is going to challenge Brian Kendrick for the Cruiserweight Championship at Survivor Series. Not only will this be the fifth cross-branded match on the card, but if Kalisto wins, he'll be bringing the title and the entire Cruiserweight division with him to SmackDown. If that is not fucking game-changing, I don't know what to tell you, man. That is massive, and it all relies on the back of Kalisto. I don't like Kalisto, man. I, I love the Lucha Dragons. I thought they had tremendous upside. But Kalisto hasn't done anything since. Now, for the first time in months, I am going to be cheering my little heart out for Kalisto to win. The other interpromotional singles matches at Survivor Series will feature Dolph Ziggler defending his Intercontinental Championship against Sami Zayn in probably the one match I am looking forward to most as far as in-ring active uh, action goes. Zayn defeated Rusev on Raw to earn the right to face the show off with major implications on the line at the pay-per-view. So because neither World Championship, Tag Team Belts, or the Women's Title will be up for grabs, Survivor Series... Uh, the stakes at Survivor Series will be raised for the IC and Cruiserweight straps. Good. It puts importance on those titles that really need it. According to Catch Side Seats, it appears the plan to execute a double switch in regards to the championships is in place. The double switch is a different scenario than a double turn, though that too was discussed back in August. The superstars in question uh, were Roman Reigns and Seth Rollins, but since both have turned face in the week's Following that report, the major double turn was next for both men. The double switch talked about now would be in regards to the title belts, the IC and the Cruiserweight. The plan, as of now, is for Kalisto to defeat Ryan Kendrick for the Cruiserweight Championship at Survivor Series and bring with him the rest of the division to Tuesday nights. That plan makes sense considering the fact that WWE will be introducing 205 Live to the fold with a show exclusively featuring the Cruiserweights, which will air immediately after SmackDown, that will tape during SmackDown. Bringing the entire division with him would offer Kendrick the opportunity to exercise a rematch option if the WWE wanted to put the belt back on him. But ever since the brand split was announced following the reintroduction of the Cruiserweights, fans felt the logical thing to do was put them on SmackDown, especially considering the fact that Daniel Bryan was advocating hard for them. Not to mention, he was in the broadcast booth with Mauro Ronaldo, and they did a fantastic fucking job. They were there for 10 weeks, and head and shoulders were better than any announced team on Monday Night Raw and SmackDown prior to the brand split. 
Now, the puzzling thing, of course, is that this would mean there would be two mid-card titles on Raw and none on SmackDown. Reigns is the current United States champion, and there are no plans in the works that would see him switch shows. There haven't been any indications that Ziggler would move to Monday nights, and the possibility of him retaining the Survivor Series uh, or the Intercontinental Championship at Survivor Series certainly remains. However, because of his relationship with on-screen authorities on SmackDown, has uh, I've always been positive. It would be peculiar to see him change sides. We should also keep in mind that Ziggler will first defend the IC title against The Miz next week on the 900th episode of SmackDown, and The Miz has certainly had issues with the blue brand management. Now, I don't know what to think about this, man. I, I really don't. Clearly, we know what needs to happen. We as fans who watch the show week in and week out know what needs to happen. The Cruiserweights need to be on SmackDown. They need to be off Monday Night Raw completely. Because all they did was brag and hype and fucking just announce it to the world. The Cruiserweights are exclusive to Monday Night Raw. But they weren't. They weren't. These guys, all of them, were seen on NXT spread throughout. Most of them competed in the Dusty Classic. So they're not exclusive to Monday Night Raw. These guys, upon coming to Monday Night Raw, right from that first night in which these guys debuted on Monday Night Raw, you knew something was off. They put the cuffs on them, they put the ball and chain on them, and fucking Vince McMahon took everything that made the Cruiserweights special on the Cruiserweight Classic one week prior. Fucked everything up and killed it before anybody made their introduction on Monday Night Raw. Kevin Dunn seen these guys and he was like, hey, we can't do that on Raw. Hey, we can't have that happen on Raw. My teeth don't approve of it, man. Oh, Vince, what do you want to do, man? What do you want to do, man? You want to wrestle, huh? Two minute matches? All right, oh uh, yeah, good, good job, man. Two minute matches, yeah. Oh, the Cruiserweight Classic was terrible, by the way. It was awful. Awful. I hate wrestling. <laughs> Kevin Dunn hates wrestling. He hates wrestling. He's there for the money. He don't give a fuck about the talent. He don't give a fuck. He, he don't even fucking probably know who the talent is. Fuck that guy. Kevin Dunn. <laughs> they took everything and killed it. Killed it. And then week after week after week... Two-minute matches, three-minute matches, four-minute matches. Nothing but six-man tag team matches. I mean, you go back. And I would, you know, as punishment for Kevin Dunn, I would have him sit down in a room and I would have him watch Cody Ibushi and Cedric Alexander, Cody Ibushi and TJ Perkins on repeat all day long until he gets it through his mind. Bro. This is how the cruiserweights are supposed to perform on Monday Night Raw. Not six-man tag matches, not tag team matches, not the same fucking teams we've seen week after week after week in shit storylines. They need to be on SmackDown. They need to be on SmackDown. No question. Absolutely no question. The one thing I'm concerned with here is the fact that WWE is going to do this switch, okay? I'm all for the Cruiserweights being on SmackDown. I love it. They got more Ronaldo calling the action. They're going to they, they're gonna thrive on SmackDown. Whoever's writing them over there knows how to book. They know what needs to be done. They know how to book NXT. Ryan Ward came over from fucking NXT. He knows what needs to be done. Triple H is overseeing SmackDown. He knows what needs to be done. You know, Triple H is going to be there. He's going to be in charge of 205 Live. They will get things right, and we will see some resemblance of the Cruiserweight Classic again. I know this for a fact. I am comfortable in saying that, and I do think that's going to happen. The other thing I'm concerned about here is, or the main thing that I'm concerned about here, is Sami Zayn, okay, and Dolph Ziggler. Do you take the Intercontinental Championship off of SmackDown? And move it to Raw? Why? I mean, I want you guys to look up and down the roster. Really. 
I want you guys to Google it. I want you to WWE.com it. Where is Monday Night Raw's mid-card? There is none. There is none. At all. Look at the roster. There is no mid-card. And if there is, I'm not seeing it. It's filled with nobodies that the people do not care about. So you're going to take the Intercontinental title and put it on Raw, but who is Sami Zayn going to defend it against? Are we going to see him and Rusev time and time again? Are they going to conjoin the titles? Is there going to be a unification match between the U.S. champion and the Intercontinental champion? I mean, I don't understand, man. The 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 common sense thing to do here is is for Sami Zayn to win it and move over to SmackDown. SmackDown needs to be rebolstered. Th- th- we know this for a fact. You know? SmackDown needs more talent. Monday Night Raw seemingly has all the fucking talent. They got Finn Balor coming back, right? They got all the talent. They're not utilizing them correctly. SmackDown doesn't have the talent Monday Night Raw has. They got the better creative writing ta- uh, team and staff, but they need more talent to work with. Now, I don't know about you guys. I think Sami Zayn would fucking do fantastic on SmackDown. Defend the IC title for a little bit. Him and Ziggler going back and forth. Sami Zayn and The Miz going back and forth. People would appreciate Sami Zayn a little bit more. You'd have more Ronaldo making him sound and look like a fucking superstar. Sami Zayn could eventually could move into the world title situation, man. Zayn versus Wyatt. Zayn versus Orton. Zayn versus Cena. Zayn versus Styles. I mean, if there's anything that needs to be done here, it's Sami Zayn needs to go over to SmackDown and get a fucking restart button. But you're going to move the IC title over to Monday Night Raw. Where's the mid card? There is none. There is absolutely no mid card on Monday Night Raw. And you're not doing anything with Sami Zayn on Monday Night Raw. Anyway, for the most part, he's been taking place in main event tapings or superstar tapings. Whatever show is affiliated with Raw. Who the fuck cares? Nobody's watching it. Nobody. Sami Zayn is not being used at all. So it's not going to harm Monday Night Raw if he moves over to SmackDown. Period. So the Cruiserweights and Zayn need to move over to SmackDown. You cannot take a mid-card title off of SmackDown. You can't. Because not everybody is a main event. You're going you're gonna to leave Ziggler and a Miz and whoever else is there. Corbin, a Kalisto. Uh, at this point, Kalisto is probably moving to the Cruiserweight uh, division. But Baron Corbin, Apollo Crews, what are these guys going to be fighting for? Unless you're going to really sit down and mold these guys into main event talent. I don't see that happening. What are you going to leave those guys to fight for? Because not everybody's going to be in the main event. Nobody's going to be in the main event. You're going to have your main event guys. You're going to have your mid-card guys. You're going to have your cruiserweight guys. You're going to have your tag team and women's. So they need something to fight for. The mid-card, or lack of, already has something to fight for in Roman Reigns' United States Championship. But then you look at the main event on Monday Night Raw. Who's the main event? Rollins, Jericho, Owens. And now they're using Reigns in the main event. Meanwhile, he should be in the mid-card defending against a Rusev, which we just got done with, right? And a Sami Zayn. And a Neville, right? Or am I losing my fucking mind here? So that's what needs to happen. Zayn needs to win. He needs to go over to SmackDown by some fucking storyline loophole. He needs to move over to SmackDown. The Cruiserweights, we know for a fact that they need to move over to SmackDown. They are absolutely dying a miserable fucking death over on Monday Night Raw. Whoever thought that was going to work, clearly you are a complete fucking retard. Awful. That's what needs to happen. So I don't know what WWE needs to do, but... They need to work on having that happen. Booker T, speaking of SmackDown, he wants James Ellsworth out of the company and back to the indies. While a lot of fans love the character, not everyone feels the same way about James Ellis. Fucking idiot. Booker T apparently feels that the character is getting old and should be sent back to the independent wrestling circuit as reported by 411 Mania. During the interview, Booker T flat out stated that he was tired of seeing James Ellsworth as an underdog character that WWE, that took over WWE by storm. The former World Heavyweight Champion acknowledged that Ellsworth 
Had a hell of a run with the company, but he feels like it's time to send him back down to the minor leagues. When it comes to the independent wrestling circuit, not everyone is paid the same amount of money. Your checks are based on your name value and drawing power. Thanks to his run in WWE, James Ellsworth has increased his ability to ask for more money from promoters. He can do that because local fans recognize him more now than a typical performer that you would see at a smaller show. Despite wanting to see the character gone from WWE, Booker T attempted to remind fans that he is not a hater. He acknowledged that Hornswoggle was a character that lasted much longer than he normally should have. Booker T reminded everyone that Hornswoggle was able to stay with World Wrestling Entertainment for six or seven years. While the odds of James Ellsworth pulling off the same thing are pretty slim, he might be able to or he might not be able to stick around for a decent amount of time. One of the final comments that Booker T made on James Ellsworth might have revealed his true motive here. He stated that there were plenty of performers in reality of wrestling, a promotion based in Houston that he owns, who deserved the spot instead of James Ellsworth. This led many to believe that Booker T is simply against a performer like Ellsworth because he feels like his guys should have been given a chance over Ellsworth. Booker T is a veteran of this industry, so he already knows how to speak to the media. He knows that he is allowed to say and what he needs to uh, avoid saying. The fact that he has been open about Ellsworth leads many to believe that he is purposely sending a message to WWE. Management is quite committed to NXT and wants to bring performers up to the main roster through their own system. That might be something that Booker T is against because it affects his business venture. Considering how much Vince McMahon loves having control over things, it is highly unlikely that Booker T can make much of a change with the comments that he made about James Ellsworth. Things are going to pass through NXT regardless of what he says. Even though NXT is under the WWE umbrella, McMahon still has issues with the brand, which is something that does not come as a surprise to anyone that has worked with a strong-minded CEO, CEO before. Why he has any issues with NXT is beyond me, man. What a fucking buffoon. That's your future. That is your future, you know? Look at what they're going to do on Saturday. Look at what they're going to do on Saturday. That's what WWE needs to do, and I'm talking about TakeOver Toronto. It's going to be the best show of the weekend, including Survivor Series and Raw. And every big-time event that we see in NXT TakeOver, uh, you know, coincide with, it's always the case, you know? WrestleMania weekend, SummerSlam weekend, going to be the Royal Rumble weekend, Survivor Series weekend. It's, it's no different. So why he has an issue with NXT, I, this guy is out of his fucking mind. It will be interesting to see if James Ellsworth gets a hold of this news. It will also be interesting to see if things are awkward backstage in WWE. Booker T is the veteran, so Ellsworth would be wise to let this go and not cause a scene backstage. I don't see Ellsworth as the type of guy to cause a scene backstage. He just looks so laid back and appreciative of this fucking position that he's in. I don't see him causing any any commotion backstage at all. You know, this is not a battle he's going to win anyway. This is just the nature of the business. Ellsworth has people in his corner, but this is not something that should escalate at all from this point. At the end of the day, Booker T does not make big decisions in WWE. James Ellsworth should just attempt to appease those people that he is working for and that are keeping him employed. All I'm going to say is this, you know, Booker T, I, I appreciate someone who's open and honest like that. You don't find that a lot, you know, someone to speak his mind about something that he does not like, and I can appreciate that wholeheartedly, man. But I do, uh, I do agree with him. You know, James Ellsworth could go back to the Indies. He should go back to the Indies. WWE should use him sparingly here and there. You know, I don't even, I don't even know why he's going to be at the Survivor Series, to be honest with you. I, you know, it, he played his role. He is the bridge between Ambrose and AJ Styles. Keep it at that. He doesn't need to be a mascot at the Survivor Series. The next time we, see, we should see James Ellsworth is a surprise entrant in the Royal Rumble. You know, have him surprise some people, man. Have him pull a fucking, you know, I wouldn't say have him pull a, a Ric Flair, but have him pull like a Bob Backlund in, in the Royal Rumble, 1990, 1993. Have him be in there for, you know, an hour. Give him the fucking accolade. Whatever the case may be, man, have him get a big elimination. One elimination, but have it be a big one, you know? But he needs to be out of the main event scene. I think a lot of people at this point are 
looking at James Ellsworth and they're looking at SmackDown and they're like, yeah, SmackDown sucks. I mean, look who's in the fucking main event scene. They got James Ellsworth and fucking six-man tags main eventing on SmackDown. I understand your frustration. I feel the same way. But WWE is a company that doesn't know when to quit. They will give you something on and on and on and on over and over and over again. And they don't realize that when they do that, they're doing more damage than good. I understand this guy has got t-shirts now. I understand he has merchandise and you want to get his name out there and sell the merch. I understand that. But he doesn't need to be in the limelight. I think he stayed overstayed his welcome and it's time to move him out and move on to business as usual, man. And the business is Styles versus Ambrose and them fighting over the WWE Championship without Ellsworth in the picture. That's it. Get him out. I wholeheartedly agree with Booker T. But Ellsworth, he's going to continue doing what he has to do. And I'm happy for him, man. I'm happy that someone like that is getting a shot in WWE. This is truly a different day and age, you know? Back in the day, Ellsworth wouldn't even been looked at. Today, WWE sees Ellsworth, they see some money in him, and then they're, and they're getting as much mileage out of him that they could. Good on him. So, Booker T, I can appreciate it, but it is time for Ellsworth to move on. And finally, guys, this is an interesting story here. I, I do want to say Billy Corgan has settled his... Differences with TNA, he will be, um, I don't know what the decision is, but they settled on something. Nobody knows what it is, but he is going to do a few interviews over the next week to fill people in. He didn't reveal anything. He said it on Twitter that he and TNA and Anthem Sports have settled their differences. A decision was made. He's no longer with TNA, and he's going to do several different outlets, podcasts, and interviews, and he's going to fill people in on the information. He didn't let anything known as of this report. But I found this interesting, and I don't know what TNA is planning to do. I mean, their ratings are plummeting. Plummeting. TNA has 450... Someone tweeted me this on Saturday afternoon. TNA Wrestling has 452,000 followers on Twitter. 452,000. Matt Hardy alone just broke 1 million. So, Matt Hardy is greater than TNA. The entity that is Matt Hardy is greater than TNA. How is that even fucking a reality, dude? Seriously. When your main guy has more than double the amount of followers on Twitter, how can you even be happy with that? How could you look yourself in the mirror? That's ridiculous. That's like John Cena having, or The Undertaker, or Roman Reigns having more Twitter followers than the main WWE Twitter. You don't see something wrong with that? But no, TNA Wrestling now is planning to introduce, and I take this with a grain of salt, planning to introduce their own WWE Network-style streaming service. TNA has been experiencing a lot of craziness in the last couple of weeks, but they might just have officially lost it. We know at this point, Anthem Entertainment, the people responsible for the Fight Network and helping TNA get out of debt, is sort of taking over. This is knowledge we have already found out. However, it seems that TNA is not eyeing any ideas to help their company presently and may be f trying to focus on their future a bit too much. According to PW Insider and Mike Johnson, TNA held a conference call yesterday to talk about the issues going on with the business. This is where they confirmed Anthem being a huge part of the business by introducing Eric Nordholm to the TNA board of managers. Eric has been with Anthem for quite a while and the board will apparently be directing the company moving forward. Dixie Carter would go on to praise Anthem for helping the company financially, as she obviously should considering the massive amount of debt TNA continues to rack up. Carter claims Anthem will help bring TNA to the next level. Of course, Nordholm didn't want to miss the chance to praise the roster, and he did so. He claimed that the new agreement with TNA, which tells us there is something bigger in the planning, will help both TNA and the Fight Network moving forward. There were a lot of questions about the creative staff, which Dixie Carter put to rest. Of course, we know by now that Dave Lagana resigned from TNA Wrestling last week, which meant that creative was a worry for the company. She would claim that Billy Corgan is no longer a part of the business yet again. Of course, Corgan is still fighting to get his money, which was recently settled, and they have come to a decision in regards to Billy Corgan. Fight Network, 
Um, well, let me, let, me, let, me, let me rephrase this. So, the fight should be interesting with both TNA and Corgan going forward. Uh, like I said, they settled. Dixie Carter claimed that creative would be a bit of a collaborative effort between John Gaborik, Matt Conway, and former TNA Knockouts champion Madison Rain. So TNA's creative direction is going to be between John Gaborik, Matt Conway, and former TNA Knockouts champion Madison Rain. Boy, you guys are in for a shit show. Carter claimed that TNA was probably going to hire more people to help out in creative, but... The business is going to move forward. The big thing that got people talking was an idea about OTT streaming network using TNA content. That said, TNA may be trying to move down the same path as WWE and eventually have their own network. Obviously, unlike WWE, it might not be helpful for them to do so. They have very little money, and WWE lost money when they first tried this out. Vince McMahon, however, was a billionaire. And he still profited on a lot of things despite the initial financial loss. Now it has worked out for them, but it took a while for people to go with it. If TNA went with this idea, they would need a lot of backup profit to help out with the initial loss that the network would cause them exactly as WWE had. TNA has also mentioned that they were looking to get back into touring soon, which is good to see that they very rarely do live events these days. They also mentioned that they would like to strengthen their relationship with their Indian TV partner, Sony 6, TNA seems to do relatively well in India, so it makes sense that they would want to keep that relationship pretty tight. Interestingly, the conference call came to what PWI claimed an abrupt end. The moment an automated message said the call was being recorded. Of course, TNA never claimed that there should be no recording. However, it is quite interesting that they want to keep all of this under wraps considering TNA has claimed to be open about everything going on with the business. Did they plan to talk about more private information regarding the business, or was the conference call going to come to an end soon? Anyway, TNA, I, I don't I don't even know why I reported this. I quite frankly don't even care, man. They're worried about getting their own network up, and they can barely fucking get their own television shows on pop TV. You know? This is not the most important thing you should be concerned with. Obviously, the, ma the main thing that I took away from this is the fact that they don't know what the fuck's going on. They don't know who they're going to place where as far as day-to-day -day business operations. But you're thinking about a network. Really makes sense, Dixie Carter. Really makes sense. This company is a fucking disaster. A, a fucking disaster. I don't know what is going on, but I feel sorry for all you guys who are TNA diehards who fucking watch this shit, sticking with them. Trying to poke at me. Oh, look, the, uh, the JD TNA is still alive. Yeah, they're still alive. But where are they going? They are going nowhere. So why should I care? The only thing people care about when it comes to TNA is Matt and Jeff Hardy. And if they did not have the Hardy camp, this company would be fucking dead. Matt Hardy is the life source for TNA. Other than that, they have absolutely... Nothing going on for them. There is so much wrong with that company. I don't even want to get into it. I just felt like it was fucking ridiculous of them to be reporting something like this and even talking about it that I wanted to let you guys know where these brilliant minds over at TNA are going as far as direction for the company now that Anthem Sports is funding them to produce television. This is where they want to go. Streaming style service. Great. Awesome. Let me know what you guys think about that. I, quite frankly, don't even care. And they got bigger fish to fry, to be quite honest with you. Uh, a style, a network-style streaming service is not the way to go. Get your television shows right and get people in place that are going to take this business to the next level. That's all you got to worry about. Don't worry about what WWE is doing. Don't worry about mocking or copying WWE. Worry about getting your feet on the ground after this fucking disaster known as TNA and these fucking lawsuits and the debt and the Billy Corgan situation. Get back on your feet and get back to doing day-to-day -day business operations for your company and showing your talent that we are headed in the right direction instead of moving backwards. That's all you got to worry about. But that's it, guys. Thank you so much for Off The Script this weekend. If you enjoyed the video, hit that thumbs up. Let me know what you guys are thinking about everything. Make sure to check the description for everything, man. Patreon.com slash JD from NY206. If you guys want to pledge and donate to the show, the channel, the podcast. If you guys don't want to do that, wrestling, pro wrestling tees.com, barbershop window. Get your t-shirts, man. Official merchandise for off the script. 
barbershopwindow.com. Type off the script in the search bar. It'll take you right to my online shop. Make sure to, guys, follow me on Twitter, at JD from NY206. Subscribe to the YouTube channel if you have not done so already. Keep an eye on Wrestle Rumble, $500 cash, and, and Royal Rumble tickets for luxury box seats coming Survivor Series weekend. That will be imminent this week. I will let you guys know about what's going on with that. Make sure, guys, get my brother's t-shirt, man, Legionary. They have music coming out, t-shirts to go with the new EP. Link is down below. Make sure you guys check out his website, bandcamp.com. Legionary, awesome stuff there. If you enjoy the music, buy a t-shirt, buy the music as well. If you guys want to check out WWE Slam Crate by Luke Crate, it is available now. Use the link that I provide down in the description for you and the coupon code. I'm going to save you some money, man. JD from NY, 10% off. And Russell Crate, if you guys want Russell Crate, man, at Russell Crate on Twitter and WrestleCrate.com website, save you 10% off on there. JD sent me. It saves you 10% off on that as well, man. I'm getting out of here. I feel my voice going for some reason. I fucking did a one-hour SummerSlam special for WW2K17, and I live-streamed episode 5 of Universe Mode, which is live on my channel right now for WW2K17. So my voice is okay, but it's not full strength. So I'm going to get out of here, man. I'm going to relax for the rest of the weekend. Thank you guys so much for everything. Hit that thumbs up, and I will see you right back here for Monday Night Raw Review. Until then, I'll talk to you guys later, man. Make it a great week.